our group three and four nucleic acids, RM proteins, are our last two macromolecule groups to examine within our biochemistry chapter. Let's look at group three first, proteins. Proteins are the most versatile of life's molecules. Uh, and they are both important for structure and function. They are 50% of dry weight of most of our cells. Uh, they do have several functions that uh, range from a variety of things such as support, metabolism, transport, defense, regulation, motion, so on and so forth. <clears throat> proteins and their functions include, so some specifics here include membranous proteins, which will allow things to uh, go across the cell membrane back and forth that cannot readily pass through the cell membrane. We have enzymatic proteins and enzymes uh, function as catalyst, and a catalyst is anything that is used to speed up a chemical reaction. You have keratin as a protein. That's the protein of our, our hair and nails, example, fingernails and toenails. Muscle proteins are actinomycin. If you should take anatomy senior year, you'll talk about the actinomycin filaments. These would be the protein filaments that slide over one another during muscle contraction. Uh, a protein called collagen is what used, is used in making connective tissue. So uh, that also plays a role in movement for uh, bone tissue, connecting to muscle tissue, so on and so forth. Uh, you have hormone. Hormones are regulator proteins. An example that we talked about when we did our carbohydrates was the hormone insulin, which regulates blood sugar glucose. And lastly, another type of protein they should know an example is hemoglobin. <clears throat> and hemoglobin is a transport protein that carries the oxygen molecule in red blood cells. So there are many other types, especially enzymatic proteins that uh, uh, exist in all living things. We won't cover all of them. You could probably just have one entire biology course on, on the many different types of proteins for just one living organism. Uh, these are just some of the few examples that I let you know for this class. So proteins are macromolecules that are made up of uh, monomers called amino acids. So the amino acid is the subunits that come together to form the more complex protein molecules. Between each amino acid, you have a peptide bond, and peptide bonds formed via dehydration synthesis. So when an, uh, an amino acid loses, one amino acid will lose that hydroxyl group and the other one will lose a hydrogen. The bond that forms there is a special type of bond called the peptide bond. And if you keep adding amino acids to this chain that is forming, you end up forming a polypeptide. So a single amino acid is called just that, an amino acid. That would be the monomer. And then when you have two amino acids coming together, that would be a dipeptide. When you have three, you have a tripeptide, and when you have more than three, up to a hundred or more, uh, that would be a polypeptide. And a polypeptide chain is when many amino acids are bonded together. A protein may have many polypeptide chains incorporated into it. And here's an example of one of those reactions. We will also draw this in class. So if you look at the typical structure of an amino acid, for example, if you look at just this first one here, here you can see that NHH amino group. On the other end, you have that C double bond OH. That's a totally other functional group there. That's called the carboxyl group. And then down below here, you have that R group. That R group is what you call the rest of the hydrocarbon. So here we lose that hydroxyl group to amino acid 1. Over here, we lose that hydrogen to amino acid 2. That would go together to form that water molecule as a product. And then right there, you have the two amino acids joining together to form a dipeptide. And right there, is where that special bond is to link the two amino acids together. That's what we call the peptide bond. So amino acids, the variety of them is due to the R group. And if you look here, these are the uh, 20 different amino acids that occur within living things. So it's only 20 amino acids that are different from one another. And how do these 20 amino acids differ? It's in their hydrocarbon portion of the molecule, where that R group would be. 
but every amino acid has that amino group, it has that carboxyl group, and then you have the differences in the hydrocarbon portion of those molecules to give us the 20 essential amino acids to living things. It's how these and the arrangement and sequence of these and how many of these were bond together to form the many diverse proteins and their many diverse functions for all living organisms here on planet Earth. So the shape of a protein is necessary to its function, and we will look at this. Denaturation, or uh, when you denature a protein, it's the irreversible change of protein shape caused by temperature or pH changes. So when we go out of homeostatic conditions, we can unravel or denature a protein, and therefore if that's an enzymatic protein which would be used to carry out a chemical reaction, you now have destroyed that enzyme, and that reaction may not, or probably most likely will not occur that reaction will not occur. So if we look, levels of protein structure, here they are. Uh, you have primary level, so the primary level is a sequence of amino acids that are bonded together. Often you could think of this as like a, a beaded necklace or a pearl necklace, where if it breaks and you just have a chain of beads, that would be the primary level. The next then is when you get this kind of uh, helix forming due to hydrogen bonding. So what happens is hydrogen bonding occurs between amino acids and it causes the polypeptide to form an alpha helix or a pleated sheath. So if you think of it, you could think of the, the primary structure now twisting as though it were a slinky or a spiral staircase. Or you get these amino acid chains that are held together to form that pleated sheath. From there, if you look at that secondary structure and the secondary structure starts to fold over on itself, now you are going into the tertiary structure. And this is a, a, a more globular in shape than for, say, the secondary or the primary structure. And what happens in, this, uh, in the tertiary structure, you get this due in part to the covalent bonds that occur between the R groups. Now the polypeptide folds and twists, and therefore you get that, that characteristic shape. You also have some other types of bonding that can occur in there. For example, you get disulfide bridge bonds that will occur at different points of the, the polypeptide, all holding it together. I often like to say that if you take that slinky structure and now you have been playing with it and it starts to get kinks and it starts to fold up and gets tangled, that's what the tertiary structure would look like. And then when you start to bring more than one polypeptide subunit together, that's when you form the quaternary structure. And the quaternary structure, it's at this level that, that occurs when two or more polypeptides joined to form that single protein molecule. These are the levels of protein structure. I'll discuss this a little bit more in class uh, when we go review this material with each other. <clears throat> our last group of macromolecules are the nucleic acids. Uh, these are our information molecules. Uh, the two nucleic acids that you need to be aware of are DNA and RNA. DNA is pronounced deoxyribonucleic acid. It is our genetic material. The other one is ribonucleic acid. And it's a copy of the DNA that is used to make proteins. And we'll study this later in the year when we get into protein synthesis. Both are polymers of nucleotides, which are the monomer subunits that would come together to form the polynucleotide. So in general, nucleotides are made up of a sugar, a five-carbon sugar that you've learned when we did the uh, pentose sugars back in carbohydrates. That would be ribose and deoxyribose. A nitrogenous base, and we'll look at the different nitrogenous bases. And you have a phosphate group. So the basic difference is be able to compare and contrast DNA and RNA. If you look, the five carbon sugar of DNA is deoxyribose, hence its name, deoxyribonucleic acid. And then the five carbon sugar in RNA is ribose. Its five carbon name is ribose, five carbon sugar ribose. The nitrogenous bases of DNA include adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine, A, G, T, C. In RNA, all of them are the same, but one. You have adenine, you have guanine, you have cytosine, but in RNA, you have the nucleotide uracil, where in DNA, you would have the nucleotide thymine. DNA itself is a double-stranded molecule with base pairing. RNA is a single-stranded molecule. So in DNA, because it's double-stranded and you have base pairing occurring, you do have the presence of this helix, where in RNA, you do not. So if you look, here is the basic structure of a nucleotide. 
Here you can see that five carbon sugar, one, two, three, four, and there would be the fish sugar attaching to that phosphate group, and over here you'd have that nitrogenous base. So if this were a nucleotide of RNA, that five carbon sugar would be ribose, and that uh, nucleotide there, that nitrogenous base there, would be uh, adenine, cytosine, guanine, or, or uracil. If it were DNA, the five carbon sugar there would be deoxyribose, and the nitrogenous bases, it could be one of four, which would be adenine, thymine, cytosine, or guanine. So if you look, here is a structure of what a typical polynucleotide would look like. Alternating down the side, you'd have a phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. And then on the inside, you'd have those nitrogenous bases there. Here's DNA. DNA is the double helix. So again, you have the two sides, uh, two uh, strands that are held together be between, uh, via these bonds occurring between the nucleotides. The alternating backbone is sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. In the middle, we have adenine and thymine, cytosine bonding with guanine. These little bonds here are the weakest of the bond types that we studied so far in class. Those would be hydrogen bonds. And this will have great significance, and we'll discuss this, uh, why a weak bond is important here when we get later into gen molecular genetics and we talk about DNA replication. So the Human Genome Project, what's so special about it? The Human Genome Project may lead to new disease treatments. Sequence the genome of humans uh, is, is what the Human Genome Project was about. And uh, scientists created genetic profiles, and it's used to predict diseases, example type 2 diabetes, schizophrenia, so on and so forth. And it's used to make specific treatments. Um, we'll have a, a, an activity related to this topic, the Human Genome Project and the discovery of the DNA molecule as a writing assignment. The last nucleotide, the nucleotide ATP, is the cell's energy carrier. Um, it is adenosine triphosphate, ATP, a nucleotide with a base of adenine, and then the sugar ribose, uh, uh, making a compound adenosine. And then what's fascinating here is you have three phosphate groups that are attached to this molecule. When you hydrolyze a phosphate group from ATP, you get the release of energy, and then you form adenosine diphosphate, ADP. So if you look, uh, let me quick do this a little bit. If you look here, uh, here you can see it. Um, uh, Now you can see it here. Uh, here we have ATP, so we have that adenine. Here's the sugar, and then we have these three phosphate groups. This terminal bond there, which would be the last bond that connects the third phosphate to the second phosphate, is where energy is stored. So when that bond is hydrolyzed and you release that third phosphate, now you form ADP. So you get adenosine diphosphate plus a phosphate group and energy. Now. ATP and ADP are like rechargeable batteries. So when an ATP molecule is used up in our cells and gives us energy, because ATP is the high energy molecule of our cells, and you form ADP, basically all you need to do then is have a, a, a reaction, bring that together where that phosphate group is going to reattach, and you're going to have energy stored in that bond again to form ATP. So like rechargeable batteries, you could use up the energy, but then you could plug it back on the wall, and you can recycle those batteries. So ATP and ADP are constantly being recycled as you remove and add uh, a phosphate group to the molecules. That's it for chapter three, uh, biochemistry, and we'll discuss this in class. But as far as the notes are concerned, you pretty much have everything other than a few reactions and a few of our discussion topics in class and the protein worksheet. Have a great day and enjoy your weekend.